I expect you all know the story of the life of the Buddha. So I won't go through the whole story in detail. If you don't know it, it's quite easy to find. You can Google it and read it, and you can do that after the retreat. But I want to pick out one part of the life story of the Buddha. If you remember, the Buddha went out seeking an answer to a question. You could say he had a huato. What is suffering? How come there is suffering? Is there a way beyond suffering? He was driven to search, to try to find an answer to this. He was very troubled by the discovery of suffering and death. And he visited many spiritual teachers, learned and practiced many practices, became expert at many of them, didn't seem to find his answer. He practiced asceticism, extreme asceticism, for many years, probably nearly died, wasted away, didn't find an answer. So he took a, a different approach. He took a little sustenance and remembering a childhood experience of spontaneous meditation, just sitting open. He sat under the Bodhi tree and sat. And he watched his mind. He'd learned many practices of how to switch the mind off, how to still the mind, how to go into very deep, silent states. But this was a little different. He sat there with his mind, experienced his mind. He didn't turn away from it. In the symbolism of the story, he confronted Mara. He confronted his own thoughts. He confronted the temptations in the mind. He confronted the fears. The story might present these as Mara, the demon Mara tempting him, the demon Mara trying to frighten him. But actually these were just his own mind. And this time, instead of using his techniques he'd learned to avoid facing these, to switch these off, he sat there with them. I mean, you could say he sort of played a game with Mara. He says, oh, is that all you can do to frighten me? Try harder. Come again. Try a bit. You can do better than that. I'm ready for it. I don't need to run and hide. And this shift of practice led to his breakthrough to enlightenment. So what's going on here? Well, in the terms of the way I'm presenting it, we can link it to what I said about let through, let be, let go. He didn't say, don't let it through, keep it away, it's dangerous, I might get tempted, I might get frightened. No, he just placed it, let it through. Let it be. He did, he, you could say he engaged with it. He responded to Mara. He fully addressed what was arising in the mind. There was no denial, no avoidance. And he let go. There was no hanging on. When he was tempted, he didn't give way to temptation. When he was frightened, he didn't run away. He just let the phenomena of the mind passed through, and he witnessed them all. So that's what we're doing. We can do that too. We're practicing with the Buddha. We're practicing the way of the Buddha. So you could say that his great life search was driven by a hotu, but maybe you could also say he was practicing silent illumination, sitting silently under the tree, witnessing the activity of the mind, experiencing 
all that arose. The significance of this is that he was able to see this process of mental constructions that I mentioned yesterday. If you're not looking at the mind, you're not really in a position to notice what's going on. But if you actually directly observe the mind, you catch yourself out. You go, ah, that's what I'm doing. And he came to see his mental constructions. He came to see that he'd built this suffering in his own mind. The metaphor he used was of the house builder. He'd been seeking the house builder and now the house builder has been seen through. The rafters have fallen down. The ridge pole too. No more will there be building. No more will he fall for the trap of the believing mental constructions. A practitioner once described his experience to me this way. He saw the self selfing. Looking into his mind, he saw the self doing its thing. And he said it was painful to realize what he'd been doing to himself. If you can stabilize your awareness on this method, then you have the opportunity to notice yourself selfing and to let go of it, to stop falling for the story and to be actually in the present experience. The Buddha demolished the house, but each of us has to do it for ourselves. That is the process we're engaged in. So we have to realize that we've built a house, a castle in the sky, you might say. We've built imaginary constructions, but we believe them. We fall for the trick. But by refining our awareness, getting more and more fully in contact with our ongoing being, we begin to notice this process in action. And we see it as just something added, a process that we're adding that doesn't have to be added. We can drop that activity and just be with the fundamental, shall we say, the root before we created the suffering for ourselves. So this is where this practice is heading. You could say that we're emulating the Buddha, sitting under the Bodhi tree, watching our minds, examining our minds. And to the extent that we're failing to be aware of our minds, we're training ourselves to be more aware, to be more present, to be more in contact, to have wider open eyes, a wider open consciousness. And then we can see, we can have insight, we can see into the process that's been tricking us up till now all our lives. And with that recognition, we can drop out of that game. When you see the game as a game, it's much easier to let go of it. When you're involved in it and imagine it's your life, it's very hard. But if you settle more and more deeply into the practice, there comes a point in which you just spot it as a game, and one which doesn't need to be played at this particular moment. I'll let go of it. I'll just sit here. And you notice the mind tries to give you more and more games to tempt you. But you don't need to engage with them. Carry on just sitting and see through them all.